All right, so we've got another uh, compressor teardown here that uh, I was asked to uh, create a video on from our uh, my good friend of mine, uh, Ty Brenneman. So I'm going to go ahead and put this one together for everybody. I'm not going to spoil it. So this is a uh, an LG VRF compressor. Um, your model number is right here on the side. Now, again, uh, the complaint for this one is a lack of compression within the actual compressor itself. When we showed up to the call, um, it was running. Uh, this is the oil. Wow, look how beautiful that is. Let's, let's just take a peek at this really quick. Uh, it is so dark. I mean, let's even put it side by side with another VRF compressor failure that we tore down today. And uh, uh, yeah, there's kind of no comparison, right? Uh, so this is completely carbon burned out, uh, full of debris. Uh, this is an extreme burnout scenario. So when we talk about burnouts on compressors, especially inverter compressors, um, that is what we're talking about when we talk about doing compressor cleanup kits. We're looking to filter out what you're going to now have this all throughout your system. We'll get to that. Let's talk about compressor at its at its core here. So this is our actual uh, discharge top right here. This is suction. Suction inlet goes right here on the top. As you can see, we've cut it open. Um, and I've already got some things that I'm really concerned about. Um, if you look at the metal paste slurry that we have here, uh, you'll also notice something really interesting. Uh, on this compressor, with which is vapor injected, we have a uh, we have a nice little metal screen there, right? It's going to catch all the debris in our system, right? And actually, you can see it caught a few things uh, from coming into the compressor. However, it did not seem to allow this compressor to live as long as it probably should have. Um, what you're seeing here is a slurry metal paste of ground up scroll plates, right? This is not burn marks. This is paste, right? We look at it under our amazing microscope here. Do, 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 do. Look at that. Basically a metal confetti that's been ground up and thrown all across our top. So one thing I don't like about LG's design is that there's no top pressure plate. Uh, when we talk about a top pressure plate, when we talk about a Daikin compressor, uh, there is a top pressure plate that comes out of the top of the actual compressor on the fixed scroll, where it then, here it is, uh, right? Discharge gas comes out of the top of the compressor, it hits the top pressure plate dome, it's redirected over at a 45 degree angle down into the base of the compressor. So there's that. So the top of the compressor for a Daikin compressor is somewhat of a low pressure, uh, depending upon the mode and, and, and you know occupancy and, and speeds of the compressor, pressures, yada, yada, yada. What I don't like about this is that the LG compressor, we're actually relying on the top discharge shell to then spray everything that comes through the compression process against the top of it, and then, you know, hope it finds its way back where it's supposed to go. Now, of course it does um, over time, but this is our inlet, or not inlet, sorry, suction inlet, which again, we're relying on this piece of metal to make contact with this rubber O-ring gasket seal at the top of this plate. But then also, the discharge gas we're looking at comes out the top here through the center hole. So when it comes out, it hits that top discharge pressure plate right at the top of this compressor. And then it comes down here on the side through the discharge side. So it's hitting that plate and then pushing its way back down through the side, right? High pressure shell, which means that this underneath is all under a high pressure state. And then it's discharged out the side here into the system itself. Now, the cool thing about this compressor, which I mean, I use the term cool pretty loosely here, is that you've actually got two connections at the base of the compressor. Um, you've got one here, which actually is a crankcase heater, somewhat for oil within the base, which sticks out here with two little pin connectors on the side, which you can see I've ground off. And then the other one is actually an oil port that's designed to connect at the base of the compressor. So let's look at that section really quick before we get into the really good stuff. This is the base oil system of an LG VRF compressor. Now you've got this nice, beautiful metal screen that's designed to filter out any contaminants and keep it from getting clogged or plugged. But also you've got this nice little cone hat that looks like a little uh, pilgrim's hat. That, that, that's that connection that we talked about for the oil port on the side. Again, this has two oil connections. It's got the one that's over there on the base of the compressor and then one right above it, which is here. Now, if you look at this shape, um, somewhat of an odd shape, but sure, I can go with it. Um, you'll notice, right, there's a chamber. And so we use what is considered as like a, a gear drive for that oil return on that VRF compressor. Now this one here, 
is actually using these gears. These gears are driven by the actual rotor at the base there, right? It plugs in and as the compressor rotates, it drives these gears, which then drives the oil pressure. It's designed to not only pull oil in from the left-hand side, um, but also uh, the right-hand side and then feed that up into the center shaft on itself. And so, again, I don't know a whole lot about LG compressors, but I can tell you what I can see, what I can touch, what I can feel, and what I understand about compressors. So this, again, is my rotor which is really glad i magnetized to that look at that just slammed with metal shavings you can see how it's kind of bubbled up around the outside again this is a magnet uh, this magnet probably weighs close to um, i don't know maybe eight pounds if i had to guess um, you've got bearings on the inside when we say bearings these are sleeve bearings they're just really um, you know tight connections that don't actually have any bearings in themselves or balls that are rotating and these are just sleeves. Now, there's not a whole lot of wear on this particular bearing, both at the top and the bottom, which is kind of impressive for its state. But again, we're just going to put that there, stay, and take a look back over here. So again, contamination, metal shavings, you can see it. Don't need to put this one under a microscope. It's pretty, it's pretty severe. It's pretty dirty. Um, oil ports are clean, surprisingly. You can see all the way down to the bottom there through the center shaft. But this is where it gets good. Oh, and then here, bottom plate. You can notice also LG compressors, not a huge fan either. The Daikin compressors, we have three magnets, one, two, three. LG compressors is just the one. And you can see this one is at max capacity. And let's put that under the microscope really quick. I say microscope, use that term loosely here. Look at that. So what happens? This magnet is designed to catch metal shavings as it's done, but of course, when it looks like this, it's at max capacity, and so any metal shavings that now come into the compressor can't be loaded to this magnet, and so what do they do? Well, they go where they, all metal shavings are supposed to go, through the oil pump, through the base of the compressor, up through the shaft. Now, again, they have this screen, but again, how long will this screen protect it? You can already see it's caught some particles, but again, like any other screen or metal filter in a system or a water filtration system, it will get plugged over time, it will get clogged over time, and then guess what? No more oil. Compressors love it when no more oil comes through. You can see where I kind of pulled all these high pressure checks out. As you can see here, these are just for differential pressures uh, within the compressor. Remember, high pressure uh, scrolls such as this and low ambience with vapor injection. If it gets to a certain point in that compression process and it reaches the desired pressure within that compression process, instead of going through the entire compression process and all the way around the scroll, it will then push open these plates. Uh, one is a sealing plate underneath and the other is that actual check. And so again, this has to be strong enough to bend this metal backwards to release that high pressure to bypass the compression process. And that's for efficiency uh, that happens at low loads. It happens when we've got um, high pressure differentials in systems. And so um, that's what that's for. But as you can see, I mean, this entire thing is just like the top coated and blasted vapor injection port on the side suction port here um, still not pretty not the best um, but this is where it gets this is where it gets good um okay there you go so no scrolls these scrolls have been completely milled off and completely torn off um, at the base here and let's see what that looks like right there you go just completely ripped to sheds. So much so that when we shook the compressor before we cut it open, this is what we heard. Slishing and sloshing of scroll plates. Yes, this is what scroll plates look like when they compress one thing that is incompressible. Want to take a guess? Liquid. When liquid enters a compressor at a high volume, at a high rate of speed, this is what happens. You completely obliterate your scroll plate into a million teeny tiny pieces that look like this. This is what happens when cast iron hits a liquid when it's running at a high rate of speed. It turns into a jigsaw puzzle. And here's the thing too. Not only did, now how you say, how do I know that it, it happened at a high rate of speed? And the reason I would say that is well, because one, when liquid refrigerant comes into a scroll set, and let's say that it's at a small amount and then it gets larger and larger and larger, um, compressor meets resistance, and what it'll do is it'll start to overamp and the compressor will shut off. The reason we know that this is at a high rate of speed, but also that it's a large amount of liquid, well, one, we know it's a large amount of liquid because look, look at this jigsaw puzzle. This is all scroll plates. This is your center part of your scroll plate, hence the shape that it's in. 
this is, a, is just completely obliterated, right? The first one breaks loose on the outside edge, whether it's this piece here or it's this piece here. And then from there, that gets into the actual compression process. And then the rest is history. It just tears it all to pieces. But then again, you say, how do I know this happened at a high rate of speed? Well, because not only did it mill down the actual scroll plates on both the fixed scroll and also the orbital scroll, which is extremely hard to do. Well, maybe not for LG, but uh, for most Daikin compressors, it's difficult to do. But for something like this, it didn't just obliterate these two scrolls, but it also completely broke the cast iron mount in which the fixed scroll was attached to. I mean, we're talking a, a, a system that is designed to withstand some serious pressure and weight. It completely sheared it off. So that means that not only was it running and then it just hit it and then just obliterated and kept running, then it just completely broke off the mount that holds the fixed scroll, right? This is designed to bolt in these bolt hole patterns around the outside that actually, remember, this piece here that this connects to is, is pressed and welded into the actual housing and the casing of this compressor. So in order to break this off in this size, at this rate of speed, it had to be extremely high to just completely dislodge it all together. And it came across, and it came out in a bunch of different pieces, but here's also the unsettling thing. So the great thing about the compressor cutter that we have, um, huge shout out to uh, Brian for getting that to me and allowing us to build it here at Kalos, um, is the fact that, you know, it allows us to look at anything that we find within the compressor and understand that it's not from the angle grinder, it's not from the cross-contamination of it. Um, it allows me to actually see what's in the compressor and know that anything that I find within the compressor is fair game as to what is to, what would have contributed to the failure of the compressor and or would have been sucked into the compressor during the life of the compressor. And that tells the whole story here. But here's the other thing. So with this jigsaw puzzle, I'm not going to try to put it back together. This, however, the compressor mount is a little alarming because I've been through this compressor with a fine tooth comb several times now, including my table, and I have yet to find this piece here. So we put it back together because we want to know, one, how it broke apart and what the failure points are for stress, but also, two, we want to ensure that any pieces that have come out of this compressor or broke down out of this compressor are no longer left in the system, right? Uh, large chunks of metal floating around that are going to cause restrictions after I change a compressor like this is a problem and that little tiny piece still holding on for dear life so again here's your orbital scroll plate might as well be a uh, cast iron cooking surface at this point um you know not a lot of crazy wear on the back side for bearings um on, on multiple sides but you just look at that look at that slurry i mean i mean my gloves are covered in it the table is covered in it um i'm gonna you know this is just this is insane and so when we talk about compressor cleanup we talk about mitigating contamination in a system i mean you look at the slurry paste that's in the base of this and it's like okay well when this was running even before it failed and obliterated the scrolls where did that go right all refrigerant in the system passes through the compressors this is the heart of the system and so if this is the heart of the system and that's what the oil looks like in the system which goes around the system you know, not the refrigerant oil separators don't catch it all then how, what do my expansion valves look like right what do my solenoid valves look like? What do my heat exchangers look like? What about all the capillary tubes within my system? And you say, well, there's metal strainers. They'll catch it. And again, sure, they might catch some, but can they catch all of it? Will they, will they catch anything before it's already been damaged? Um, you know, these are the questions that we have to answer. And so something like this, a severe failure like this. And again, this compressor was still running when we went to the service call, when we went to site. The compressor was running and there was no pressure differential in the system. And so, you know, something like this now would require us to put canister filter dryers on the system, lock it into cooling. Um, I mean, just look at the, just look at the color of the windings themselves, right? Just slap dirty, um, you know, coated, you know, you can't even clean this. And the discoloration also could be due to high amounts of heat. You know, this system would need a complete overhaul on, on a refrigeration cleanup process. That would require us to pull canister filters regularly, check pressure, pressure differentials, and then monitor the conditions. Again, you say, well, what could cause so much of the damage like this? And that would be, again, something at a high rate of speed. Let's say one indoor fan coil running and cooling, uh, getting liquid refrigerant. All other units satisfy. That unit may be right, still having large amounts of liquid refrigerant flow through it due to a, a uh, you know, dirty evaporator coil or dirty filters. 
um, you know, and that be the, the only source where refrigerants coming back in a large quantity or even an overflown uh, accumulator, right? It's not just that teeny tiny thing. This is the scenario. You've got that fan coil, poor cooling, poor cooling performance, right? Someone goes out there, they don't know what they're doing. They look at the system, they see it's on a low suction pressure. And so what do they do? They add charge and they add more charge and more charge and more charge until we get 20 pounds overcharged. And so when the system goes back to a low load again, right, our accumulator fills up and then it overflows to the point where we get large amounts of liquid that are coming back to the scroll place. Now the system ramps back up in high demand. Where does all that liquid refrigerant on the accumulator go when the rate of speed and the volume of refrigerant is flowing in that outdoor unit? Well, of course, where's it going to go? It's going to go through the compressor. Here you go, right? This is what liquid refrigerant does to scroll plates. It eats them alive. So, okay. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.